So just a brief summary context to uh, Psalm chapter 7. In Psalm chapter 1, we see the contrast between the righteous and the wicked. Psalm chapter 2, we see the sovereign rule and reign of God with his anointed. Psalm chapter 3, David previously fled from his son Absalom. So David has a morning prayer, trusting in God. Psalm chapter 4, David completes an evening prayer. Let me add, so Psalm chapter 3, it's the morning, David's praying. Psalm chapter 4, it's the evening, David's praying. Very convicting, he's praying from morning till night. Psalm chapter 5, David given a specific kind of prayer, asking God to do with his enemies. Psalm chapter 6, we see David's prayer in time of trouble and was grieving over his sin and asking God to use him for his glory's sake. I'm seeing a pattern of prayer in this man's life. We have a supernatural contrast running parallel. Just like in salvation, God is 100% sovereign in control of our salvation. Salvation's all of the Lord. But yet we're still responsible. There's this parallel going on, supernatural contrast. And just like Jesus is 100% God, 100% man, not 50%, 50%, 100%, 100% parallel, the compatible. And with David, you also see he's human. But then you see God, and David struggles with his emotions, but then you see God's word inspired, prophesying, running parallel. Just like in Psalm 22, verse 1, David speaking, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. David struggling with his human emotions, yet a prophecy about Jesus being fulfilled. Don't ask me how this parallel works, but just trust God's word. Like it says in Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So in Psalm chapter 7, we see a song, a prayer, uh, broken up into three parts. It's also like David is in a court case, presenting his case before a holy judge. First, David passionately begs the attention of the divine judge from verses 1 to 5. Second, David argues his case painfully before the divine judge from verse 6 to 16. And last, David praises the divine judge in verse 17. So we want to look at Psalm 7 in the context, but I also want to take other biblical principles from this and compare it with other scriptures. So notice in verses 1 and 2. O Lord my God, I take refuge in you. Save and deliver me from all who pursue me. Or they will tear me apart like a lion. Rip me to pieces with no one to rescue me. Not only did David have Saul and Cush falsely accusing him, but many others. If you go through First and Second Samuel, you'll see false accusations from other men in favor of Saul, King Saul. And the fact that it says in verse 1 and 2, all who, unless they, speak in plural form, multiple enemies, Sure, David had many accusers and attackers for a long period of time. The first thing I noticed is David is taking refuge in his time of distress and puts his trust in God. He knew he couldn't beat his enemies alone. As he confesses in verse 2 where David says, Oh, they will rip me to pieces. He knew he needed help in this difficult time. David realizes this is a tough battle that he cannot win. And believe me, you will feel like David sometimes, where your soul can be ripped to pieces. Why do I say that? Well, we have, we're the only creation in all creation that fights three enemies simultaneously at the same time. The first, the devil, is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know, if, you, if you've studied Job, you know that when the bad news came, because the devil was attacking him, there's a messenger come to give him some bad news. And before that messenger finishes his bad news, there's another one waiting, giving him more bad news. Before that one's finished, there's another messenger waiting to give him more bad news. And even before he's finished, there's a fourth one with more bad news about his children dying. And so he doesn't catch a break. The devil doesn't fight fair. Have you felt like that? Where it's just one bad news after the other, after the other, after the other. Your second enemy, the world is also against you. We're in a spiritual warfare, make no mistake about it. You don't believe me, go to Melbourne. If your child is asking you questions or struggling with sexuality, you're not even allowed to pray with your child. This world's not in favor of us. If you speak up against abortion, if you want to defend innocent children, the world calls you a bigot that you don't care about people's rights because you're defending innocent children. Christians are becoming criminals. 
Good has become bad and bad has become good. And your worst enemy of all, of all enemies, your own flesh. <laughs> like Paul says, everything I want to do, I don't do, and everything I shouldn't be doing, I'm doing it. A wretched man that I am. You know, Paul Washer, I remember, I think it was Paul Washer who said, it's not the devil that rejects God that sends you to hell. It's not the world that rejects God that sends you. It's you. You say no to God. The heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. David had multiple enemies as well, bringing accusations against him. He himself also sinned and prayed about it in Psalm 6, the chapter before. Talk about a war where you feel like a lion or multiple lions are ready to rip you and tear you to pieces like David mentioned in verse 2. God is the only way you could ever win that kind of war that you're having with multiple enemies at the same time. So I'd recommend like David did to take refuge in God when problems keep pursuing you like they did David in the first verse. Praise God for 1 John 4.4. 4. You dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you, the supreme one, is greater than the one in the world. God is the most powerful in this whole universe. Can you think of a better place to take refuge in? Take refuge in God in times of distress. Don't try to work it all out first. Then come to God with a plan. First run to God who has already planned it all out. Don't worry about tomorrow. Rather run to the one who is in control of tomorrow. God. Notice David didn't first run to tell his friends. And he was a military man. He had advisors. He's been to war. He could have went to all his buddies and said, let's work this out. Let's figure this out. No. He runs to God first. Not his friends. Lest it turned into a gossiping session. One man went to his friends, and it's not always wrong to go to your friends. In Daniel chapter 2, when the king decreed, whoever does interpret his dream, that all the wise men will be killed. Daniel runs to his friends. But for the sake of let's all go to God together and pray. To all take refuge in God. This is why prayer meetings on Sunday nights are a blessing. We come together. We take refuge in God together. We pray together. Well, how do we actually take refuge in God? One thing we know about refuge, it's a place you usually run towards. You go to for safety, to protect you from danger. Somewhere where you kind of move into and you live in there. The way I see David's pattern when trouble comes is he's taken and running towards God in prayer, as we saw this pattern from the Psalms that we're looking through. Usually when you come to a realization that you are weak and in a vulnerable position, you know you need help, you know you need refuge, then you seek refuge. This weakness is a great thing. It's humility, it's a need, but it also pushes you towards the ultimate safety, security and protection in God under the shadow of His wings, as we've been looking in the Psalms. Really, it is a blessing to be weak, to see your need to depend on God for refuge. You know, in Genesis 32, when Jacob was wrestling with God, he's wrestling with God. It's almost like all day and all night. It's like this battle. Then God decides to flick his hip out. <laughs> and this, it's not anymore like this is a challenge anymore. It's more like, I'm disabled. I need to lean on you. I can't even stand up straight. I'm dependent on you. It's a refuge God used. He was leaning on him because he was weakened. He ended up with a disability, but God says he was blessed. Genesis 32, then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. Blessed him with what? He was disabled at this point. He was blessed because his weakness made him dependent and needing refuge in God. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10, says, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God might allow you to suffer and be weak. 
like Jacob, Job, Paul, David, so he can realize and run and take refuge in him for his glory's sake, which will produce perseverance, which produces character. Revealed in Romans 5, what character are we talking about here? Well, I want to address uh, usually a misquotation from Romans 8. Famous verse, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Full stop. All things work together to make me happy. No, nah, it's comma, not full stop. To those who were called according to His purpose, for whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's the character. That's what that refuge causes. All things work together mean pain, suffering, weakness, weariness. Jesus also went through this in His suffering, which would cause us for a dependency on the Father too, like Jesus said as an example. David realizes and runs to God of refuge when he was weak and suffering, and we should for the purpose to be conformed to the image of God's Son, and His strength will manifest in you for His glory. When you are weak, then you will be strong. I love it when people tell me, my brothers or sisters or other people, I'm tired, I'm broken, I'm weary, I can't do it anymore. I get excited because deep down I know they're about to go to a very strong place. So go to God first in prayer like David did here and cry out to God and take refuge. Look at verses 3 to 5. Lord my God, if I have done this and there's guilt on my hands, and if I have repaid my ally with evil or without cause have robbed my foe, then let my enemy pursue me and overtake me. Let him trample my life to the ground and make me sleep in the dust. Some commentators believe David could be referring to Cush's false accusations on how he treated King Saul. We don't know 100%. It's not revealed here. But one thing we do know is David is confident in this case before the judge. Why is David so confident? Two words. Practical theology. You can't have one without the other. It's, you can't just have the head knowledge and you can't just be practical. Both are equally important. Both are balanced. I'll give you an example of one without the other. When me and Michelle got married, we lived in an apartment. We had these Mormons that would visit us every six weeks to come preach to us. And every six weeks, they switch teams and they'll come over and we'll, Michelle will always cook a feast for them. We love them first. We try to preach the gospel to them. First thing I try to do is always try to make them drink coffee because they're not allowed to. So it's probably a stumbling block, but I just want to always see how obedient they are. And I'll preach to them and I'll show them the Word of God. And these guys, I'll tell you what, they, they leave their home to come to a mission field to evangelize every day. They get baptized. They, they read their books. They're not allowed to use the internet. They don't use any of They're so obedient. They, they don't even touch any caffeine whatsoever. But every time I talk to them and I talk about what they believe in, I always tell them, listen, brother, if you die, you will still go to hell. As practical as you are, you'll still go to hell because you believe Jesus was a man who became God, brother of Lucifer, but he's still a man. And the man dying on the cross, the blood of a man cannot save. It had to be the blood of God. You can't just have practical and be works without the truth. Both are important. Knowledge is important, as Naz read for us in 2 Peter 1. Verses 2, it says, Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us every great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. Mate, there's a lot of uh, um, like practical here, here, goodness, mutual affection, love, but it also says knowledge. Both. Knowledge is important. That's why I wanted to see all of John's books yesterday when they put them out there before everyone came, but I got convicted. I said, other people need to get a chance to get some of it. But knowledge is important. 
read many good books, but live in the Bible, like Spurgeon says. So how did David take refuge? Sorry, how did David take the knowledge and make it practical? Why is David confident in his case here, in his prayer? Why the strong challenge against himself in this slong slash prayer slash court case? Well, let's look at how David dealt with his enemies in his practical walk according to God's word. I'll read it for you in 1 Samuel 9, 15, 17. Now, the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel. This is God's word now. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over my people Israel. This Saul. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked on my people, for their cry has reached me. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, This is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. Now, let's look at David's response to God's word. 1 Samuel 24, 6-7 And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay hand on him, for he is anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. And again, in 1 Samuel 26, 9, But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? To answer how he was confident, David, when he had this case, he had practical theology. When the prophet Samuel gave him God's word, he knew God's word. He practiced it. He practiced what he preached. He didn't only walk it accordingly, but did it according to God's word. This is the balance of God's word and practical. This is the balance of taking refuge in God with prayer and being in God's word. That's why he said, if I have done wrong in these accusations against him, let me be overtaken and let them trample my life to the ground. I'm not trying to say only if you're walking right with God, you should pray. Absolutely not. Even if you're not walking with God, right with God, then you should have a different kind of prayer. A broken hearted prayer like David did in Psalm chapter 6. And the Bible tells us if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So if it's, just, if it's bad to be just practical without the truth and the knowledge of God's word, and we should always read God's word to know His will. Well, what's the other extreme? Have you ever heard of people saying, puffed up with knowledge? It's actually from the Bible. If I could be transparent as a, as a brother in Christ and share where I think we as reformers in, in general could be in danger, could be. And I'm not thinking of Dromoyne Baptist personally, but reformed in general, this imbalanced line between practical alone versus theological truth alone, head knowledge alone. We could be in danger of the talking but not walking. Myself first. Honestly, I praise God that we have so much beautiful sound truth in our doctrine. We have amazing knowledge, but if we can't walk the walk with this knowledge, how much do you think of prophets? 1 Corinthians 13.2 And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mis mysteries and all knowledge... And he's not saying he has it all, he's saying even if I did. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Have you ever won a debate with your fellow brother or sister on a little minor doctrine, not fundamental, just a minor one, and won the debate but lost them? Because you could not love them. I'm guilty of this. My nickname used to be the bulldozer because I run people down when I just debate with everybody. We must speak the truth in love. But equally, if you don't speak the truth, you are not being loving. There has to be a balance. James says, What does a prophet, my brother, in chapter 2? If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, Depart in peace, great words, great knowledge, be warmed and be filled. But you do not give him the things which are needed for the body. What does a prophet? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, I, you have faith and I have works. Sh show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You can't just have the theological faith without works. And James is not trying to say this is a works-based salvation. 
James has given an analogy of this is a life faith that has life. This is a dead faith. This branch is abiding in the vine. It's receiving nutrients. It's alive, so it produces fruit. It doesn't do works to obtain it. It's already got life and it's producing. This one has no works. It's dead because it's not in Christ. Back to David. He had a good practical theology when he practiced it according to God's word. And he had a real faith with it. I always try to liken faith in this analogy. I share it with people all the time. It's like a performance show. And the performer's up the top and there's a rope from here to the end. And he's got a blindfold on the top of his head, ready to put it down. And a pole in his hands. And he's sitting on a unicycle, one tyre. And he looks down at the crowd and says, who here believes? Who here believes I can go across the rope blindfolded? And everyone's erupted and they all say, we believe, we believe, we believe. Then the performer says, who's going to get on my shoulder? And put the blindfold and go. Silence. Because that's not faith. The one who has faith will get on the shoulder and go. Put action with it. Because he believes it. It also says in First James. Oh, sorry. Um, there's also the danger of being deceived if you don't walk it. Because it does say in James 1.22. Be ye doers of the word, and not just hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he is. Talk about disillusionment. We must have a balance in practical and true theology, just like that performer at the show of the, the pole. If you have too much just only practical, he'll fall off one end. If it's not balanced, it's all knowledge, he's going to fall off. It has to be balanced. Both are important equally. I praise God for Des Moines Baptist Church's testimony. How many people I have met who testify that we have been burnt and hurt from other churches and we were just Marthas who just slaved away and now we have found refuge in Des Moines Baptist sitting at Jesus' feet like Mary and being fed well, refreshed and nourished. Not just because of the great doctrine, but get this, but because of the love that we have never seen before from the leadership in one to another. This is good, practical theology. Moving on to verses 6 and 7. Arise, Lord, in your anger. Rise up against the rage of my enemies. Awake, my God. Decree justice. Let the assembled peoples gather around you while you sit and frown over them on high. David understands God is a judge over all nations and will separate the wicked from the righteous. Because in verse 8 he says, Let the Lord judge the peoples. And other translations say countries. I believe that means all nations. He knows God will separate a people unto himself. Like he did with Israel and the church. David is struggling with God's timing for justice. Even when David stayed blameless, he was still persecuted as, and felt as if God stepped out of his judgment seat and went to sleep on his case. With the fact that he said, arise, wake up. Again, David struggling with his human emotions here. He's not alone. We struggle too. Not realizing his emotions are parallel with so much, much, much greater than him. And that was also falsely accused. Our great, perfect, sinless Savior, Jesus. Do you ever wonder where is God with his righteous anger over the wicked and not taking care of us in this fallen, wicked world that we live in? Like, why do the wicked prosper and I suffer? David does this a lot. Please, God, pay attention to my case. Where are you? Sometimes we think the same with our human emotions. Does God even care about my pain? I hope God awakes and brings justice to my case. But remember, what's the purpose of, for his glory? To be conformed into the image of his son. He knows what he's doing. To take refuge in him. And it doesn't matter how we feel. It's not always truth. That is why the knowledge of God is very important. That's why God has given us his word. And many verses like Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And no, I am with you always. Just in case you think there's a gap, no, even to the end of the age. Amen. And Isaiah 41, 10, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Very personal language there. It's not even the tip of iceberg of passages that we have in God's Word. 
I also struggled with my emotions like David and had to study a massive list of verses and passages that helped me not to trust my fallen emotions. And emotions are wonderful in the right place, in line with God's word. But trust God's word first before you let your emotions lead you first. This is called corrective thinking. Regardless of how we feel, we measure it by God's word. Back to verse 6 and 7. He will also see the grace and long suffering of a patient God to a wicked world, a world where he causes the sun and the rain to come on the just and the unjust and gives the daily needs to the just and the unjust, a world where we were enemies of God also once, not deserving God's mercy, but God was merciful to wicked people like us. I'm glad God was long suffering towards us, but judgment was still met, even for us at the cross. Some translations render verse 6 to say, Awake for me, or here in IV, my God. We see David knew he personally belonged to God and knew what God loved because he knew God's word. God loves justice and his people. He has gone straight for the heart of the judge by telling him, Do it for justice, for me, your children, to gather around you and, and glorify you. God loves his people to come together and worship him. As we saw in verse 7, let the assembled peoples gather around you. God will separate a people unto himself and they will worship him. This is an important and applicable to the church too because of Hebrews 10.25. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Let me add, if your mother is sick, your brother, your daughter, your sister, go to the hospital. It says, uh, in the habit of doing. Don't get in the habit of skipping church. But don't be legalistic either. But let us encourage one another as more you see the day approaching. God loves his people to gather together and worship him. This is a form of taking refuge when we come together on the Lord's day to worship him. David is appealing to the divine judge in his case, gone straight for justice for his people. He understood and recognized that it was God who has the power to bring justice and to protect him. Because God is able to save. David was dependent on God. Thank God that even though David was struggling with these human emotions, he knew correct theology. Verse 8, let the Lord judge the peoples. Vindicate me, Lord, according to my righteousness, according to my integrity, O Most High. David acknowledged it's God who is the perfect, divine and righteous judge, who vindicates and judges and will do what is right, not David. This is why I always tell people, don't worry about what other people think. Just stay blameless before God. He will do what is right. When I first read this verse, I thought David is the most self-righteous guy. Judge me according to my righteousness. I was like, what's this guy saying? But in the context of a court case, the accusations brought against him. It's you know, like if I was doing 50 in a 100 zone and the police tell me I was doing 150. And I go to court, I was... I, I'm, I'm righteous, I'm right in this. I was doing 50, not 150. He wasn't claiming to be sinless perfection. We know that because of Psalm 51, David says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Before I was even born, I had sin. We also know that he didn't think he had his own righteousness from verse 17 in Psalm 7. Look down the bottom where it says, we'll give thanks to the, I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing the praises of the name of the Lord Most High. And the next verse, 9. O righteous God, who searches minds and hearts, bring an end to the violence of the wicked and make the righteous secure. My shield is God Most High, who saves the upright in heart. David knew, or David knows, it's God who searches and tests the hearts and minds of all men and knows the perfect judge can end the wicked. David also understands God knows who's upright in heart and oppressed. God knows what you're struggling with. God knows I'm weak, I'm weary, I'm oppressed, I need help. David knows this. David calls God himself his shield here, which is a defense weapon. His defense is God. Again, David taking refuge in God to protect him against the wicked. Verse 11 to 13. God is a righteous judge, a God who expresses his wrath every day. If he does not relent, he will sharpen his sword. He will bend the string in his bow and string his bow. He has prepared his deadly weapons and makes ready his flaming arrows. Back in verse 6, when I said God was also long-suffering and patient, 
I never said forever suffering. God is still holy. David knows he's a just judge and will bring judgment eventually. Some commentators believe these verses are referring to the enemies of David, not relenting. So they are sharpening their deadly weapons and, and to continue to attack God's people. And some say if they don't repent, God is sharpening his sword and flaming arrows. I think it's both. I think it's the enemies of God and God. We spoke about this last Sunday night uh, in prayer meeting. In Psalm 64, we read Psalm 64. If you want to flick over to Psalm 64, I'll show you why. Just quickly flick over to 64. David, hear me, O God, as I voice my complaint. Protect my life from the threat of the enemy. Hide me from the conspiracy of the wicked, from the noisy crowd of evildoers. Verse 3, notice, they sharpen their tongues like swords and aim their words like deadly arrows. These are the same weapons mentioned here in Psalm 7. They shoot from ambush at the innocent man. They shoot at him suddenly without fear. They encourage each other in evil plans. They talk about hiding their snares. They say, who will see them? The plot injustice and say, we have devised the perfect plan. Surely the mind and heart of man are cunning. But God will shoot them with arrows. Suddenly they'll be struck down. He will turn their own tongues against them and bring them to ruin. And all who will see them will shake their heads in scorn. All mankind will fear. They'll proclaim the works of God and ponder on what he has done. Let the righteous, remember this last part of this too. Remember the right, let the righteous rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart praise him. I think this ties in back to Psalm chapter 7. I think this ties in with verses 12 and 13. Our passage about God's sword and the string and bow. Where it said their tongues and swords are like swords and arrows in 64. It's, it's kind of like a picture of this. And if you want to attack God, go for his people. If you think you can get at God, get at his, try getting at his people. It's like saying they're shooting at God by attacking his people. And the arrows go up. But they're in disillusionment. They're deceived. And it comes back down on their own heads. The mark hits their own heads. But it's also of God because he's sovereign. Because we saw it also in verse 14 and 16 in our passage. Whoever is pregnant with evil conceives trouble and gives birth to disillusionment. Whoever digs a hole and scoops it out falls into the pit they have made. The trouble they cause will cause on them. The violence comes down on their own heads. This is a simple biblical statement of you reap what you sow. And a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. If you're pregnant with evil and you think you can beat God... You will give birth to disillusionment. Thinking you can beat God, those arrows will fall on your own head. If you're pregnant with evil, you can only birth wickedness. A bad tree cannot bear good fruit. You sow in sin. If you reject Christ, you will reap hell and destruction, the mark on your own head. Not peace with God like David had. You reap what you're so simple. Galatians tells us this in 6. Verse 7 to 8, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will reap, of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. God will do of sin and bring judgment to the wicked, as we saw in verses 11 to 13. His weapons, the sword and the arrow, the bow are ready and God never misses the mark. If you ever read Exodus, when uh, God told Israel, go get the blood of a lamb and put it over your doorposts. Mark your houses with the blood of a lamb. So when the angel comes, it will only mark those who don't have the blood covering them. And whoever didn't have the blood of the lamb over them, God never missed the mark. All the firstborn died. But God passed over those who had the blood of the lamb. And I beg you, please, Take refuge in Jesus. If you want your sins to be passed through, have Jesus mark the blood of the Lamb over you. Because you're already condemned, the Bible says. You already have a mark on your head. The only way out is to take refuge in Jesus. I beg you, please, trust in Him. Take refuge in Him. Acknowledge, I can't do this on my own. I'm weak. I can't save myself. I need refuge. Come to Jesus. Like David, Jesus was falsely accused and many false accusations were made against him. And like David in the court case in front of the judge, 
Christ intercedes on our behalf with the Father, being an advocate for us, a mediator who prays to the Father for us. If you take refuge in Jesus, you can have the same confidence we have that David had in his case. Talk about a refuge. Imagine going to the court case where they're announcing the judge is also your father. This is the same situation where God is our judge, those believers, the children of God, and also our father and Jesus our advocate, like a lawyer mediating on our behalf. What a comforting refuge we have in God. We have found this balance in love for justice that Paul so love for us and also justice for sin in Jesus. It's the only way you have the balance. Just like the man, the performer performing on the unicycle. If you don't take refuge in Jesus, judgment's coming and God never misses the mark and it will come back on your own head. If you obey God, like David did here, you'll reap confidence in your problems like David did. If you sow refuge in God, you'll reap safety from God for all eternity. In closing, at the end, last verse, if you practice what you preach like David did, pray and take refuge in God like David did, you'll end up finishing your prayer like David did in verse 17. Verse 17, I'll give thanks to the Lord because of His righteousness. I will sing the praises of the name of the Lord Most High. This occurred again at the end of David's prayer in the chapter before, a couple of pages back. Right at the end, the verses 11 and 12, it says, But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. And the passage we looked at in 64, Psalm 64, right at the end, I said, memorize this. Let the righteous rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in Him. Let all upright in heart praise Him. Always at the end of this psalm, he's got this pattern. Big difference from the way he started praying in the beginning. David usually starts his songs and his prayer with, I'm in despair, I'm weak, I'm about to be destroyed, ripped, torn to pieces, I need refuge. To usually finishing with, I'm rejoicing, I'm singing, I'm praising, I'm celebrating. Many times I've come to God broken in sadness, despair, tired, weary, stressed. Then after much prayer, I have so much peace and joy. Why? It's because I was in the refuge of God and experienced His shield and His safety. And I have tasted peace and security. And all of a sudden I'm rejoicing, about to break out in song and dancing even, I feel like. Don't be afraid to suffer, to be weak, tired, struggle. Take refuge in the Lord like David did. And God's strength will follow. Practice what you know theologically like David did. Then you'll reap and sow and be confident and rejoice in the Lord like David did. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you so much for being our refuge, our shield, our protection. And we thank you also for everything you allow in our lives, Lord God. We thank you for how it shapes us and molds us. And conforms us into the image of Christ. And also still get to reap joy and rejoicing. Lord God, we thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for Dromoyne Baptist's testimony, Lord God. The love for one another. The firmness in standing in truth. And I pray we'll always be faithful to you, Lord God, for your glory's sake. We pray, Lord God, that we don't forget, Lord God, that when we struggle with our thoughts and our heart, we always come back to your word and to remember your truths, Lord God. We pray in Jesus' name, our Lord. Amen.